Hello, friends. Today I'm talking about unprocessed trauma from the past. I want to talk about what it does to you as an adult, right? If you have trauma from the past and it's still inside of you, how it can sometimes even sabotage your adult life or things that are happening in your adult life. I want to talk about that. And then I want to give you guys some exercises to help you to start processing that trauma. And I'm going to do it in a series of three small videos with exercises that you can begin doing. And I'll explain what those three videos are about in the end of this video, but I'm mentioning it now so that you can make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you're notified of when they come out, because to be honest, this is a new channel for me and I'm still not quite organized with how or when I post my videos. I'm giving myself some grace with that, but eventually, eventually I'll be on a schedule. But until then, make sure you hit that bell icon so that you're notified. So talking about unprocessed trauma, before it's unprocessed, it is trauma. And trauma isn't exactly what is happening. Obviously it is in part something that you're going through, but what makes it go from a very bad experience to a traumatic trauma experience is what you begin to believe about yourself. Okay. So for example, in childhood, anything can cause trauma. Sometimes we think, oh, you have to have had it so horrible and so bad. Actually, no, the truth is a child's perception can create trauma. For example, a, an infant that goes through a medical experience where they're um, in the hospital, they're going through an operation, they're going through a medical procedure that causes pain. That infant doesn't understand what's happening. They don't have the understanding about why they're in this pain, but it's causing pain. It's causing emotions in the body that feel uncomfortable. And so that infant can reach a conclusion that life is scary people are dangerous or I'm not safe, right? Those are just some beliefs that can be formed. And once those beliefs are formed, that's where the trauma comes in because we start living life through the lens of those beliefs. Another example could be a child who has uh, a single parent and that single parent is a wonderful, loving person, but they're a single parent. So they have to work two to three jobs just to put a roof over the, the head of, of themselves and their child. And so the child doesn't have the time that he or she needs with the parent. And so they conclude I'm not loved or I'm not worthy of mom or dad's attention, or there's something wrong with me because mom or dad don't want to be around me. Now, none of that is true. It is a child's perception, but that's the thing with trauma. It doesn't matter if it's because the person is bad or intentionally harming you. It's the belief that gets formed and kind of hardwired into the child's psyche that causes the trauma. And obviously when toxic parents are involved, it forms trauma. For example, anytime a child has an emotion that a toxic parent doesn't like, like let's say the child is happy. And you would think, well, why would a parent be mad if a child is happy? Well, if that child sadly has a narcissistic parent, narcissists hate happiness because they can't feel it. So to see their child feeling happy, they have to stamp it out. And they often stamp it out by shaming that child. And so the child, every time they're happy, they're shamed. They develop a belief. I'm not allowed to have my own feelings or feelings aren't safe. Happiness isn't safe or my job is to erase myself to make the other person happy. They get all of these limiting beliefs that form the trauma through which they now live their life through that lens, right? So as a result of that, as a result of those beliefs, the child develops coping skills to survive. So the coping skill of the last one that I mentioned is the child won't be happy. They'll stifle their feelings because it keeps them safe. A child that has a belief that I'm unworthy, um, I'm not enough for my parent, even if that parent was just a loving single parent that just didn't have the time because they were taking care of the needs, the more pressing needs of the child, that the coping skill of that might be, I'm going to 
do everything I can to make people happy so that I'm not abandoned. And that might involve abandoning myself, abandoning my emotions, abandoning things I love and just pleasing people because if I can make them happy and if I can just make sure that they don't get upset or angry or disappointed with me, then I'm enough and then I won't be abandoned. So that people pleasing becomes the coping skill. And the other one where I'm not safe, right? If there's a belief I'm not safe, the coping skill might be hypervigilance where you just never relax, where you're living life as if every step you take, there is a possible mine underneath it. Fast forward to adulthood and the hypervigilance now keeps you in a very small world, right? You're so scared of everything, things that don't even make sense because that's what it is with the nervous system. The nervous system is fast and dumb. So what I mean by that is it acts very quickly, but it tends to group things together that don't belong, that don't logically make sense. So for example, if you felt unsafe around a toxic person, right? And that toxic person gives you this look and you it makes you feel unsafe and now you're in your fight or flight, your nervous system doesn't just associate it with that person. It also associates it with somebody angry. And so now you go into the store. You go into the store and the person behind the counter is just having a really bad day and it has nothing to do with you, but they're unhappy and they have a similar expression on their face as the toxic person that abused you. And you now associate going out to the store with panic and fear and it closes in your world. Somebody that is a people pleaser in childhood because they had to as a coping skill in adulthood winds up attracting toxic people because you enter every relationship like i don't matter i'm here to make you happy forget about my needs healthy people don't like that healthy people want you to be you they want to show up as two separate whole people having a relationship so what is attracted to that is toxic people People that are like, oh, yes, you're right. I'm the one that matters. You don't matter. Glad we don't have to, you know, battle about that. And you wind up repeating the one sided relationship that you experienced in childhood over and over again. So I think you guys get the picture, right? That the trauma gets formed in childhood. It becomes the filter through which we see our lives. That filter winds up filtering out anything that's not similar to it. And so we wind up almost recreating our childhood dynamics, which is why so many of us married, married our parent, right? It's the exact personality. We wound up marrying that parent. So how do you process? How do you process trauma from the past? And that's what I want to shift into now. How do you process the emotions? Now in childhood, when we have those beliefs, those beliefs are very painful to believe that you're not worthy, to believe that you're not enough, to believe that you're not safe, to believe that you don't matter causes pain, okay? You can't have that belief without some kind of physical somatic experience with it. And that pain in the body feels horrible. That pain can also be accompanied with shame. And shame is one of those emotions that nobody wants it in their body. It is the most uncomfortable emotion that comes up inside of the body. So the child is suppressing. In childhood, you're just suppressing that. And you're living in your coping skill because by being in your coping skill, you're not noticing the emotion that you're suppressing. So we want to be able to process that emotion that we suppressed so that we don't have to stay stuck in a coping skill, which is like a Band-Aid on a bullet wound, which is like putting a pot out for a leaky roof, right? Yes, it rains, so now I'm gonna put the pot out and, or the bucket and it's gonna catch that rain, but every time it rains, I gotta do the same thing. So every time I'm feeling shame, I gotta do the same coping skill. Every time you know, I feel unworthy, I go into my same coping skills. So it's just symptom management. So we have to really go into that emotion and process it. Now, I've seen people process things in a way that winds up causing re-traumatization, and that is not what we want to do. 
Like I've spoken to people that are like, yes, I'm, I'm processing pain from the past. And I sometimes I'll ask them, well, how do you do that? And they're like, I just bring it up and I just soak in it. I'm like, well, that's great that, you know, you're giving yourself permission to feel that's an awesome first step, right? The fact that we're actually giving ourselves permission, but then what do you do? And they're like, well, I just sit with it until, you know, it stays with me for days and weeks until finally it goes away. I'm like, well, what makes it go away? Well, it just was there for so long, I guess. I don't know. It just kind of evaporates or goes away. But I want to give you guys a better way because when you just allow it to come up, and there's that phrase, like you feel it to heal it. And I totally get that. Like we do have to feel it to heal it. But if we feel it without processing it, we are simply bringing it up to feel that trauma again. And then it goes right back into the system because if it's not processed, it has nowhere to go. It goes right back into the body. We bring it up, we re-traumatize and we put it right back into the body. And that is prolonging suffering. So we don't want to do that. At the same time, processing a, a emotion from the past is something that we want to be responsible about because if we're not ready and we go too fast, we re-traumatize the nervous system as well. And this is where people that have gone through trauma, they struggle because they want to feel, they want to get it over with. They want to move on with their lives. And I totally get that because I was there at one time in my life. I was like, okay, let's just do this. Let's get it over with so I can move on. But that doesn't work. It doesn't work because when we're working with the nervous system and what's stuck in the body, we're actually getting in touch with pieces of us from the past that have almost the emotional makeup of when we were a child, four to six years old. Our limbic network has the emotional makeup of a child four to six years old. So how we treat ourselves when we're getting in touch with that is going to either cause the nervous system like a child to freeze up, right? Think of when you're impatient with a four-year-old and you're like, what? You still can't do that? Why don't you get it over with? Why? I can't believe you. Why are you still here doing that? No child is going to learn with that. They're going to freeze. So with the same compassion, and patience that we would have with a child is how we want to work through processing our emotions from the past, because if we don't, it's not going to work. It's definitely not going to work. And we also want to go at a pace that's comfortable for the nervous system, which is why I'm breaking up the exercises in three videos. The first video is going to be just about learning how to notice the trauma inside, the stuck energy inside. Okay. That may sound simple, but it's not when you've lived life through trauma and you are always externally focused, right? You're always externally focused because your survival was on the line. So you were like hypervigilant all the time. You noticed everything in your surroundings, except what's inside and what's inside is where the trauma is and where the wounds are. And when you go there, there's a lot that comes up in the body. When I do somatic experiencing with my clients and they just pause and they think about uh, a memory from the past, and then I'll ask them what's going on in their body. Sometimes they're absolutely in shock with how much comes up in the body because they've never looked. So that's the first step. That's the first video. And then I recommend you do it for 21 days because they say 21 days is what helps us to create a habit. So you want to get into the habit of being able to see your emotion that's there, the energy that's there without freaking out. That's what we do. We'll see that shame. We'll feel that shame and we'll want to do something. We'll want to talk about something. We'll want to focus on something else except that. So it takes a little bit of time to do that. The second step or the second video is going to be about how to sit with that emotion in a nurturing way. So you don't want to just sit in it as if you are in it, which is like you're, you're that child again, feeling all of that shame all over again. That's not helpful. You want to be able to do it with one foot in the past, being in touch with that child piece of you that's still hurting and one foot in the present, which is your adult self, which can be a tremendous resource for that child. That will be video two. And the last video is going to be about how to process and release that stuck energy. And it'll be a meditation. 
a, a guided meditation to do that. So I'm super excited for the next few videos. Make sure again that you like and subscribe to this channel and yeah, join me on this three-part series of how to release trapped energy and emotions from the past.